It's time for the Wrestling Perspective podcast with the man of a thousand holds. That's Lars Fredrickson right there. That's the wrist lock I mean, number one on his list. <laughs> Later, I, I thought I thought it was a wrist watch. <laughs> I'm Ben Ferrell. Tonight, Lars, we have a very, very special guest. The guy I'm a fan of, you're a fan of. It's Bully Ray. And Lars, have you ever actually got to meet him in person? I have, but he totally doesn't remember. And that's it, it didn't kill my ego at all when he said, nah, I don't remember. But you know what? We've gotten to know each other. He's like my best friend now. So it's all good. He's we're coming over Christmas. <laughs> we're total best friends right now. <laughs> <laughs> 2.30 dinner, Bully. What about you, Dennis? You know what? I, I met him one time, 2007, at a Ring of Honor show with P.D. Williams here in Detroit. And I was – 2017, I'm sorry. And um, I was excited. I'm like, Pete, will you introduce me to him? He goes, probably not. Uh, he's he's a little bit uh, – just, just know that uh, if you come across him, be very careful. I said, I, absolutely. So we walk into the arena, and he's sitting there, and he goes, PD, what's up? shake hands they hug and they start talking about something private he goes oh, who's your buddy there he goes oh this is my buddy dennis he goes you look familiar i think i know you I go, you you don't know me i've never met you you go no you got a face and i'm not sure if i like you or not i gotta think <laughs> about it i'm like he goes you know after a minute of that he goes where would i know you from i go i do fantasy football he goes i don't do that shit he goes all right you go stand over there in that corner where i talk to pd i go Yes, sir. And I went instead in the corner, <laughs> like a good little boy. So he put baby in the corner. <laughs> uh, I love Petey. I've always been a fan of Petey. I, I, on a personal level, he's always been a really good dude, very respectful. I always loved what he did in the ring. And I've been saying this for a long time now. If it's not Petey Williams doing a Canadian Destroyer, it's not a Canadian Destroyer. It should become be called something completely different. Oh man, I, I it's totally my agree. it's my favorite um, finishing move, like original finishing move of any singles guy out there. I love Petey's Destroyer. And it's about time you finally kind of moved up from that ranking of just being an impact mid level guy to actually working in the WWE as Lars and I friends with him. I, I can't be more proud of him. Yeah, he, he's a good dude. I'm very happy for him. All right, I'm going to start the question off with uh, something I kind of always ask the newer guys and now talking to an established veteran who went through it. And I'm a kind of a stickler on the evolution of a character. And, you know, you had this amazing, you know, Bubba Ray Dudley for so long. And then for whatever the reason, you look down the barrel of a gun and have to some, for whatever reason, change your character up, which we, we all know the reason moving on. Was that like a scary moment? Did you embrace it? into like the bully ray character um it wasn't a scary moment it was an inevitable moment because me and devon had gotten to the point where there was nothing left to do we were very fortunate to do anything and everything we wanted to do every major federation every set major set of tag team championships at that time japan tokyo dome um you know, Wrestle Kingdom, ECW, WWF, uh, TNA, you know, it had been, I kind of look at it like when Alexander the Great looked across the land and realized there were no more lands left to conquer, and, you know, and he started to cr cry, like me and Devon just looked at each other like, what's left? And I said to him, I go, you know, you've always kind of wanted to do this on your own. You've always wanted to try and have a singles run. I go, why don't you go try your singles run and I'll do the same thing. And, uh, you know, we'll just, we'll just see how it goes. They didn't, they didn't have any real plans for either one of us. We just knew that it was time. And I came up with a storyline of how would we break up? I didn't want to do the typical tag team split. I wanted it to be about something different. I wanted it to be about something unique. And I looked at, you know, what about our act was unique and it was our finishing move. It was the 3D, the Dudley death drop, and how nobody had kicked out of it for, I don't know, 15, 16 years up until that point. We had kept our finish so strong. So we, I, I came up with a storyline that involved the Motor City Machine Guns, uh, uh, Chris Sabin and Alex Shelley. And, you know, they needed, the, they needed that next step, you know, in their tag team career. They needed 
some some a great credible win and we did this thing where if we couldn't beat them we were going to retire and I we hit Chris Saban with the three D and Devon covered Saban one two Saban kicked out holy crap you know first time everybody anybody's ever kicked out of three D and then we go on TV the next night to retire and that's when I turned on Devon and I said you're the weakest link and you know and that's where I went on my way and he went on his way I just looked at it as a challenge. I never wanted to be a singles guy. I, I, I when as a kid watching Gurria and Martel and the Samoans yeah. and Fuji and Saito and the Samoans <laughs> um, and the Strongbows, I, I love tag team wrestling. To me, four guys were a lot more exciting than two. I always knew I wanted to be a tag wrestler. Being a singles wrestler never, ever, ever interest, interested me. And we got to that point, if I wanted my career to continue, so that's when the reinvention began. Yeah, I mean, because that, that was actually my next question, because that's one of the things that I'll ask guys who, you know, have obviously been in very successful tag teams, and you've also been very successful as a singles wrestler. What did you prefer? And you kind of answered it by saying, you know, you always wanted to be a tag team wrestler. Um, you know, the difference, there's obviously a lot of difference because, you know, you're in there by yourself, you got no one to back you up. Did you find it um, like when you started to really do it or did you find it liberating in any way? I loved it. I loved it. Once I got past the initial nerves of it, because as a singles, you know, when you're in a tag team match, if you blow up or if you need a second, you can always tag out. Me and Devon always prided ourselves in the fact that we, we weren't going to be on the cover of muscle and fitness but you would never blow <laughs> us up ever in the ring. Um, but there, you know, you knew you could always tag out if you needed to. Now as a singles guy, all you have to do is rely on your own. And I remember like in the WWE, I had a singles match against Kurt Angle. I think I had a, sing I had a singles match against Eddie Guerrero. I remember real nerves during those times. because so I was like, Oh my God, can I really do this on my own? Could I really do this on my own? And thank God I was in there with guys like Kurt and Eddie who could help me along in that, in that singles match. But I got over this real quick in TNA. And the minute I started to hit my stride, I, uh, I, I embraced it. The difference for me, the challenge for me was mentally. Cause I think in terms of four, not in terms of two, I think in terms of how to keep the action right. constantly moving, there's never a lull. And Lars, to me, it's all rock and roll, man. You know, a, a Dudley match is like is like going to a to a Kiss show. We're going to sure. start off with Detroit Rock City. We're going to play Shout It Out Loud. We might bring you down a little bit with some heat and Beth, but then we're going to go home and rock and roll all night. We're going to you know blow the fire, spit some blood. Thank you. Good night. We're Kiss. And, I, I you know, like how, I like how Beth is the heel in that. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I don't biggest, know the I'm, biggest hit of all time is the heel. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what, that fucking bummed me out. I'm sorry, Beth bummed me out. When I first heard that at like seven years old, I was like, ah. <laughs> I, I remember I came home because the flip side was Detroit Rock City, and I played it for my brother. He goes, That's not Kiss. You're lying. They made a mistake. <laughs> but it was. Anyways, Dennis, I digress. Uh, kind of from my story at the top of the show, you, you had a very like reputation of about being a tough guy. You know, look, you don't want to talk to people. You're a busy guy sometimes. And I get it. Now you're on the other side. You're doing a hit podcast radio show, which, by the way, welcome to the club. Do you see <laughs> things different now that you're part of the media? You're You're not, you know, you're on the other side now having to interview guys. Do you go... All right, because I, I don't know if you beforehand, if what, what you thought of dirt sheets or the writers or if you ever gave them much time, but now you're kind of one of us. It, has anything changed <coughs> your view of wrestling beyond this side of the mic? Well, first, let me address the perception and the reality thing. OK, Bubba has this insane perception. And then the reality is you actually talk to him for five minutes. You go, hey, wait a minute. This is not nearly as bad as I thought it was going to be. I stood in the corner, so I may not. Be <laughs> I did put enough. you in the corner. I yeah. did put you in the corner. My See, when it comes to business, I'm extremely intense. I'm a perfectionist. I hold, I look people in the eye and I hold people accountable. That was from myself first, my partner, 
and whoever we were working with. If you ask the guys that I've worked with over the years, let's just take the obvious ones, the Matt and the Jeff Hardys, the Edge and the Christians. Yeah, we'll all bust each other's chops. And you're like, Christian likes to call me Bubba Koresh, like David Koresh, you know, you know. <laughs> I had this cult following and you had to listen to me. But once you get past all the jokes, you realize that no, nobody's really that difficult to work with. We're just all, we expect something out of one another. And, and, and I was intense about it. Lars, I'm sure that when you're writing a song or when, you know, you t- if, if the band is not up to snuff one night, you might turn around and go, hey guys, come on, let's go. And, and that's how I was every night. I was really intense about it. Um, so I, I, I say that people have to have their Bubba moment and the Bubba moment is when you actually talk to me and you realize that he's not nearly the monster that I heard he was. Um, as far as the dirt sheets are concerned, I feel the same way about them as I always have not a fan. Um, it's okay for people to have their opinions, but, uh, to me, pro wrestling is a very, very, it's a very particular industry when it comes to entertainment and athleticism and so much involved. And I don't think you can truly grasp how difficult what we do is unless you've been out there and done it. If uh, when it comes to star ratings, when Ric Flair decides to do a star rating on a match, I'll listen. Right. Otherwise, the only opinion that matters is the response in the audience. How many critics said Rancid was the greatest band that they have ever heard? Not many. Did you <laughs> listen to your critics? Never. No one ever uh, built a statue to her for a critic. So anyways, you know what I mean? So, you know, um, and, and I'm not, I don't consider myself like a part of the media. I'm a pro wrestler. I'm a pro wrestler who's now part of a radio show. I'm very happy to be there. And I ask questions that other people just won't ask because well, everyone's wanna... afraid of heat. You know, they don't want, oh, I don't want to get heat with this person or I, w- I want everybody to like me. It's very unrealistic. Well, I want to get into that, boy, because that's one of the things that I do enjoy about the radio show is that you're actually there with questions. And it's not like, you're trying to catch somebody. It's like legit questions. You know what I mean? And that's one of the things I admire about you. But at first, I kind of want to go back and talk about you and Devon and the tag team, because basically what you had was an African-American and a Caucasian together. And I don't think that could have happened in any other company besides ECW. And the reason why I say that is because you look at uh, you know companies like GCW that are having and other companies uh you know, independence, having transgender wrestling and wrestlers, even though they've been doing it in Mexico for years with the Exoticos and et cetera. But I mean, how, you know, that was kind of a game changer having you two and, and then the brother gimmick being brothers, you know, I mean, how did you, I mean, did you catch any heat for that? Because obviously it was a different time. And, and do you see like it as a, a, one of those barriers being broken? In retrospect, it, it never, ever crossed either one of our minds. The, the, the color of our skin was it, was, it was never a thing. Nobody even asked us those questions back in the day. Uh, me and Devon had such a chemistry. You got to remember there were nine Dudleys. <clears throat> and, <laughs> and, the, and the thing was, when you didn't have something to do with somebody, you made them a Dudley. Because you could throw a tie dye and overalls and some goofy glasses on just about anybody and just come up with a character and make them part of the, the Dudley family. And that's the way it was for a while. But when me, when Demon, you know, came on the scene, me and him beat the shit out of one another. That's true. And, and we realized that in doing that, like there was a chemistry there. There was just something. It was very raw. It was a very raw chemistry. It's like right in your first. It's the, like hitting that first note with the guys that you're in the band with. When you when you when you go, whoa, this sounds different. This is different. This is not like the guy I played with last week. This is real, and that's what I felt with Devon. It was that very real feeling. Um, and I was a baby face. Devon was a heel, and I had gotten exposed in the ring. I was not trained well. I was the shits. I still am the shits. I'm just really good with smoke and mirrors. I'm a master of smoke and mirrors. But as far as wrestling concerned, awful. So thank God for tables. Um, um, 
so I, I was I was floundering as a as a, a singles guy because once they saw past the stuttering and the dancing, I actually had to wrestle and I ugh, bad. And I, I remember going to Paul one night in the arena, ECW arena, and I said, "Listen, I think me and Devon could do something together. Put us together." and see what happens. And this was the response. Okay, let's try it. That's it. And wow. we, we turned on the Sandman and little and, and Spike. And that's it. The rest is history, really. You know what I mean? And anybody that was there that saw that at that time, you know, that was that was the huge one of the hugest things to happen. So but, but when it came to come, like, I, I don't even know if you remember this, Lawrence, but I used to wear a rebel flag band. I totally, I, of course, yeah. I remember, brother. I remember. It wasn't See, even like. No, I know, but that's what I'm trying to say. It's like when you look back in retrospect, where we are now as a culture and everything. I mean, you guys were, in my opinion, were breaking bar a barrier back then because you never saw that. And I don't think it could have happened anywhere else other than ECW because of this. And it's just my opinion, just because of the freedom, like you said, like, yeah. hey, Paul. How about you put me and Diva together? Okay. And you guys obviously started fighting each other. And then the next thing you know, I mean, it's a beautiful moment when you guys come together and it's, you know, anyways, I digress. Dennis. And you know, with, when, when Big Dick was around before he passed away, God rest his soul, like we kind of joked around like the three of us, like, yeah, we're the new free birds. And, you know, the free birds with the, you know, with the rebel flag bandana. And that was like, I was a mark for the free birds, you know, who wasn't? So it, who wasn't? And, and, if Devon would have said to me like, "Oh, you know, I have a problem with that," I wouldn't have. I would never have worn. I would have been completely, you know, you know, uh, uh, cool with that situation. But the, the black and white thing was ne never popped into either one of our minds. Well, yeah, I mean, I was just thinking as a fan and being presented that like these guys are brothers. That was a cool thing for me because you know, growing up in in a mixed neighborhood, like you know, my homies were all of different shades and different colors. Yep. And it was just something relatable is all I was trying to say. And I just think at the time it was, it was a very uh, forward forward thinking moment in professional wrestling. Cause we, as we all have been fans uh, forever, I always feel like professional wrestling is like 10 years behind the curve at times okay. sometimes. Yeah. That's th that was my point, but uh, you know, kudos to you. So. Thank you. Well, you're you're WWE Hall of Famer, and how offended are you that Lars is having trouble picking which one you or Dave to be his best friend? He had Tony Khan on. He asked Tony, you know, which one of the two he should pick. Uh, and, and bully, it's almost like you coming onto our podcast and going, uh, "Do you want to be my best friend, a podcaster who you put in the corner once almost ten years ago, or a rock and roll star?" And if I'm in your position, I would be highly offended that Lars cannot make up his mind which one of you two he wants to be best friends well here's the thing lars is my newest closest bestest friend in the whole world for That's two reasons know that. a i'm a fan and b it pisses off snake from skid row so much whenever we say it on the air he's so jealous so we hit it as much as we can <laughs> hey you know what I, I i got some love for snake i met him once way back in the 90s and he was he was a very nice guy so love to snake but guess what snake hands off their mind <laughs> <laughs> so Yo, he got so he got so pissed off when he saw that picture on social media today oh so really and i was like dude your package is on the way it'll be there any day now <laughs> So, Lars, you're saying you've made up your mind now? It's obviously Bully. He's the one that's here. Okay. You know what I'm saying? LaGreca hasn't sent pierogies. You know what I mean? Well, but Greca you know what? I even return my text. So, well, what? You know, he's big leaguing you. You know what I'm saying? Right. You know? So, <laughs> with him, his you know? head is exploding by the day. <laughs> Well, one of the things that, you know, you've been talking about as of recent, I've really enjoyed the conversations. You're talking about heels and um, how that we don't really have a real legitimate heel, because like you said, there is this like fear of being canceled, fear of being, uh, you know, berated uh, in on the, the Internet. And it's like, um, do you have ideas how somebody could do it in today's world without that? Um, actually happening because I always wanted to ask you because you're a very smart 
guy, obviously, but how would you approach it if you were a heel now? What would, what are the things that, how, what would you go after? Is you my, just guess, my have question. to be smart about it. I would never go after anything in particular. You just have to find out what gets under the skin of somebody and the people that's going to resonate. It, it's, it, it's not about burying the town or it, it's not the old school, easy things to go after. But there are ways and you got to sit there and you got to think about it. You have to you, you have to figure out how to push people's buttons and pushing people's buttons is something that always came very easy to me. I will go places that most people wouldn't. Here, here's an example. And I think you've heard me talk about this on Busted Open. Eddie Kingston. Right. Mm -hmm. Everybody loves Eddie. Everybody's behind Eddie. Eddie's very real. He's very raw. He wrote that piece on social media talking about his anxiety and his fears and everything that he went through. It was a beautiful piece, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. I would eviscerate him for that. <laughs> You're a dick. <laughs> I would stand in front of him and I'd read his bootleg fucking poetry right to his face and then say something about every little one, pick the pieces out of it where I can stick the knife in, twist it, and then throw salt right on the wound. Right. right you take right. that because it's, re it's real. It's not made up. It's not canned heel heat. Here's a guy who sat down and brought it all to the forefront. He couldn't, it's kind of like writing a song, right? An emotional yeah. song. And it just comes out of you and it flows and it, the lyrics flow on the paper and it, you know, it moves through the, your, your fingers on the fretboard. That's what he did. Yeah. Now, how do we turn that around? Things like that. It's only a matter of time, but before your boy fucks all the AEW fans the same way he fucked WWE fans. Am I being serious? No. No. I go right after that. Right. right. There are so many, and there's there's ways to do it, like the UFC thing, or and, and obviously we're talking about punk right now, and I'm, I'm I'm talking about how you go for heat. You take aspects that people really believe in, really buy into, and then you say it with such conviction, such malice, with just bad intentions that people are forced to believe you it's it's not rocket science no and it's all it really is about tone it's about inflection it's about eye contact and it's it's about never sounding like you're cutting a pro wrestling promo right i mean do you agree do you disagree no no i 100 agree because like like you said you know as far as the eddie kingston thing you know, just because I always kind of think about those things, I would have went after him. Like, well, maybe you don't have any money because you need to spend all your money on a therapist or or whatever the fuck. You know, like you would go after these these little things. I really, honestly, and and I'm gonna say this here, but they broke up. I, I felt like they could have kept going with the Punk and Kingston thing, and that would have been way bigger. But that's just my opinion. Um, and I, because there was there was so much left unsaid. You know what I mean? And I, maybe they're going to get to it at the end. I don't know. I'm not a wrestling promoter, but you know, that could have, that could have, I mean, I could have seen, you know, like that old Memf uh, was it, uh, it was, was it a Memphis thing when, uh, no, it was Jim, uh, no wait, was, was it Jim Crockett when, uh, when, oh shit, I, I'm going to think about it, but he brings Jim Crockett out there. They, you know, Tony Khan could get into it. I, I, I don't know. I mean, there were so many things that I was like, wow, they could really revisit this and bring this to a whole new level, but they moved him on to MJF, whatever. But I kind of feel like we missed out a little bit with him and Eddie Kingston. But, you know, you, you touched on something about the kind of the can cancel culture. Is there anything wrestlers can look at from like stand up comedians who somehow <laughs> seem to be, for the most part, immune to the stand up culture where they can get on stage and say what they want, all in the, the, the era of, it's entertainment. We're just trying to be funny. Is there anything like wrestlers can learn from that? Maybe to bring back the old fashioned hill and escape the cancel culture. The only one who's doing that right now is MJF. And he's getting, he's, he's getting right to the edge and he's getting away with it. I think he's getting away with it because the AEW fan base doesn't want to 
you know, jump on social media and do anything to cancel him because he's an AEW guy. He's one of the pillars of the company. He's an up and coming, you know, homegrown guy. So they're not going to dogpile on the rabbit. Mind you, if MJF said the stuff that he's saying now in the WWE, there would be, there would be massive backlash. I mean, let's take a tiny, tiny little thing that he said. Is it polite to call women rats in today's day and age? No. no. Look, you guys don't even want to answer. You don't, you don't even want to go near the question. Well, no, I don't give a shit. But he's I getting away with it. Yeah, but I don't really give a shit about all that stuff. It's like I'm from a different generation, though. So it's sure. like for me, it's like, you know, watching the coddling. It's like I don't really want my wrestling to be, you know, part of that whole woke thing. You know what I mean? It's like, it's got, there's gotta be a sacred place and that's comedy and entertainment. It has to push buttons in order to get a reaction. And if everybody's doing the same fucking thing, walking on eggshells, you're not getting the reaction. Therefore your, your product is shit, you know? So it's water I mean, I'm not, it's vanilla. I, I, I totally agree. I mean, but, uh, I, 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 I don't think you should attack, you know, I mean, obviously there's some things that you don't want to do. You don't want to be coming out there with a swastika on your arm, you know, or whatever, but it's like, you. <laughs> but I mean, at the same time, it's like, I remember seeing punk at the cow palace basically start a fucking riot, you know, just be, by doing a promo. I mean, tra- I mean, the gallows is out in the ring is when they're doing the strange society. Jericho comes in and literally leaves again because there was so much trash and so much crap. Being, and this was a house show and this is what he was doing and it wasn't he wasn't he was just being a, a heel you know so i don't know that's just my opinion i, I no, I, and i respect that i i think it can be done today i think there's a black cloud of fear amongst wrestlers uh heel wrestlers they don't want any backlash they don't want to they don't they don't want the the heat on social media you can't be afraid of heat if you're afraid of it you're done I remember, do you remember a gimmick in the WWE called the Un-Americans? Yes. Christian, Lance Storm, and Test, God rest his soul. That's right, right, right. That was, that was a Vince idea. And Vince was just, he was ready to just go to the moon with it. And I think the guys were a little nervous about all the heat that they were getting. And I think they voiced their opinion. I went to Vince. I said, give me that heat, please. I want that heat. Lump that heat on me. Let me run with that heat. Now, obviously, the gimmick, the, the, the heat wasn't designed for me and Devon, but he appreciated the fact that somebody wanted to embrace it. This industry is lacking real heels. And I tweeted that the other day, Lars. I'm sure you guys saw it. Punk retweets it with a sloth yawning as if like, Ugh. nobody's going to tell me I'm wrong. Because without Darth Vader, Luke Skywalker is a whiny bitch from Tatooine. Thank you. That's all he is. You need bad guys. And I'm not talking about generic canned bad guys. Never be the bad guy just because the guy standing across from you is the good guy. Be the bad guy because you can command hatred more than he can command love. It goes, the way I look at it, it goes way deeper than typical heels and baby faces, especially in 2021. Yeah. Do you think now that there's a major promotion letting wrestlers kind of be themselves, do their own promos, we're going to start to see a trend where, listen, every, everything was written out for wrestlers. Uh, I feel like a lot of people lost creativity in, in that aspect where they were protecting their brand and guys weren't allowed to go out there and think for themselves or create on their own. And that's how you can really become a heel or somebody is when you believe it yourself, instead of some guy in a brick room, writing it out on paper and you got to go out there and say it word for word. I, I appreciate the fact that companies like AEW and the NWA are allowing the guys and gals to go out there and say the things that they want to say the way they think they should say them. I'm sure Tony is giving the talent bullet points. Billy is giving the talent bullet points. Here's the story. Here's what we need to go drive home. Now say it the way you would say it. I can't tell you how many times I've been handed a piece of paper or have seen other guys handed a piece of paper 
with words on paper that your character would never, ever say. How do you hand Ric Flair a piece of paper with, with words written on it by some 28-year-old writer who wrote for like, I don't know, Comedy Central or MTV? You just can't do it, you know? Bro, you're, you're, in a, you're in a punk band. Imagine anybody trying to do that, you know, tell you the songs you could write the lyrics you could write. Imagine somebody coming to you and going, hey, man, here's your next rancid song. And by the way, I'm sorry for handing that paper to you, Lars. <laughs> yeah, well, the ghost sit in a fucking corner, Dennis. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about is obviously, you know, the, the artistic freedom that these wrestlers are actually being able to experience. And, and they're experiencing it on TV. You know what I mean? Um, so at the end of the day for you, you know, I think you probably had a lot more freedom in TNA and that's a run that a lot of people don't really, you know, focus in. They always think of you and the Dudleys, but your run, you know, there was pretty significant. And now, did you have a lot more freedom there? Um, obviously, than you did in the WWE, WWF? Uh, we had a lot more freedom in TNA, whether it was Team 3D or Bully Ray. Uh, and the, I had the luxury of getting to work with Eric Bischoff. Eric was very, very liberal with me. We, we hit it off really quick. Um, I volunteered to, to try to save that pay-per-view with Jeff Hardy and Sting. Uh, when, when Jeff couldn't, make, couldn't really wrestle that night, he was, he was, uh, a, little, he was a little banged yeah. up. And oh, yeah. uh, I said, I turned to Eric and I said, let me go out there. I'll get you out of this. He goes, he said, what? now this is a frantic moment. He goes, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to jump sting. I'm going to lay him out. I'm going to put up, pull out a table. And then I'm going to have him reverse it on me and put me through the table. So at least the last thing that people see is sting putting me through a table and you can go off with a moment. And he's like, Eric just couldn't pull the trigger right there. So he said no. But then the next night he came up to me and he's like, thank you so much for even volunteering to do that. I don't know of many guys that would have. And then as we started to get to know each other a little more and start to work with each other, he came to me with an idea. And when I heard it, I wanted to, I, I, I cringed because he said to me, how would you feel about being the leader of a biker gang? <laughs> I was like, no, man, no. This wasn't my vision for Bully Ray at all. But it worked, bro. Come on. But, but when the booker comes to you with an idea that's his, you know damn well he's choosing you for a reason. Right. And I said, if you think that's the best way to utilize the character, I'm on board. At the end of the day, it's my job to go out there and portray what the booker or creator com creative comes up with. I'm going to throw my two cents in, but... I mean, I could have said no. Well, but here's the thing. I mean, you know, you came from tie-dye, stutter, and dancing to becoming a motorcycle club guy with that gimmick. Honestly, like, you know, that's a big range to cross, right? But somehow it fit you. And that's one of the reasons why I identified you in that role. Because those were kind of like the guys, what you look like is what they look like. Those were the guys in my neighborhood. Short hair, stocky big it's kind of plain but you just look at them and you go that motherfucker will handle me handle me and i think that's probably the reason why it struck such a chord with me um i don't remember if it's my turn to ask a question but i had just had to jump in and tell well, you i have a, i have a question for you okay is stocky your way of saying fat yes um <laughs> no i would I right would under the bus <laughs> you know, i'll tell you what it's it's not those pants that you're wearing that make your ass look fat, Bubba. <laughs> it's your ass. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna call you fat, bro. Not at least here. We Maybe save in the those, text. We save words like that for Tommy Dreamer. Right. <laughs> yeah, he's at fucking Dunkin' Donuts probably right now. Listen, you know, <laughs> working. But anyways, but uh, my, oh, so no, stocky. I just mean you're big. You're, but you moved like a guy like Bam Bam. You know what I mean? And that was one another thing, another correlation that I made, you know, and put it together. And that's why I was such a, a fan of yours and got 
you know, sort of immediately entrenched to what you were doing. So uh, bam, I don't bam. have a question. Bam Bam taught me how to lace my boots. There you go. I remember I was in the ECW arena. It's around 96. And whenever I would lace my boots, I would put one leg up on a chair and start to lace my boots. Now, at this time, I'm about 400 pounds. Wow. And, you know, Bammer from the same stomping grounds, Asbury Park, New Jersey, um, which I'm sure you know, you know, pretty well from playing, playing the clubs over there, the Pony, maybe even yep. the Saint. I don't know, maybe. Yep. Um, so he looks over at me and he says, Marcus, come here. Now, nobody calls me by my God-given name. <laughs> nobody. And he goes, come here. Let me show you how a big man laces his boots the right way. And he showed me how to stand up and drive my weight down into the boot and then tighten the laces. Because ah. if anything were to happen, the, 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 the boots are now tighter around your ankles, thus preventing your ankles from rolling. Ah. And guys, from that night on, Every time I laced my boots up until I don't know when this is Aaron, but you know, this Saturday night in the ECW arena, when I, when I kicked the shit out of Jerry Lawler, um, every time I lace my boots, I hear Bam Bam's voice telling me, Marcus, this is how a big man laces his boots. But at 400 pounds, would you call yourself stocky? <laughs> no, that was a fat bastard. <laughs> yeah. Now, you, you mentioned uh, going out there and wrestling Jerry Larler. Where are you at in your career now as far as like, look, <coughs> everybody who's anybody is going to AEW. You have a great relationship, and I'm not trying to start a rumor here, but your mindset in the wrestling industry, how much you want to go out, how much you want to wrestle, if you even still want to do it, where where are you at now that you have a comfy radio gig and you know we're working hard for money behind the mic here? I have done everything that I have wanted to do. I have wrestled everywhere that I want to wrestle. There's not an arena on the planet. I'm very, very blessed to, if I never wrestled again, I'm so cool with it. It's not funny. However, there are certain things that do interest me. Particular stories with particular talents not just going to a company and signing a contract and saying, okay, well, you'll be here for a year or two or three years. And well, what am I going to be doing? Ah, we don't know. We'll come up with something. I'm not interested. If it's a particular person with a particular story with dedicated television time, then I'm interested. Like this thing with Lawler on Saturday night, when they called me, they're like, do you want to wrestle Jerry Lawler? Yes. I've never wrestled Jerry Lawler. It's, it's Jerry Lawler. It's to me, it's a no brainer. You know, it's, it's, it, did I ever think that I was going to have a singles match with Jerry Lawler? No. Was it on my bucket list? No, but it's not something I'm going to turn down, you know? Um, so, and it's in the, it's in the ECW arena, Lawler's history with ECW it was an immediate yes, because it interests me. It moved me. It evoked emotion. If you can't evoke emotion in me, I could care less. I, I, I've become so fueled by real, raw, organic emotion that that's it for me. Do I see guys out there that I would love to sink my teeth into? Because I know I could present a certain story, elevate a certain guy. Listen, no matter how over you are in this business, you need somebody at the next level. Right. Who does Chris Jericho have to work with? That's been my biggest uh, complaint right now. I'm not saying that I'm the guy to work with Jericho. I'm just saying, who does Chris work up to? What gets Chris's juices flowing? Everybody needs somebody, just the way Austin needed McMahon. No matter what stage you are at your career, you know, I, I just think, and especially with a, a company like AEW, where there are so many guys who need that lex, next level talent. There's only, there's only so many Chris Jerichos in, in that locker room. 
You know, I think they could be utilizing Christian a lot better than they are right now. Yeah, that's for sure. I, I mean, that, to me, that's just a no brainer. But for me, it has to be, I know of certain talent out there that I could do some really great business with that would draw money and pop ratings. Well, that was, you know, you mentioned something about your bucket list and how Lawler maybe not have been on it, but it's like, here's an opportunity for you to come back and get in the ring with him. Throughout your career, was there somebody that was on your bucket list that you never got to wrestle? Road Warriors. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, that's, 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 the, that's the no-brainer one. It was the Road Warriors. You know, that's the, that's the, the match we were looking for. We, uh, we were lucky enough in TNA, we got to have a tag match against Road Warrior Animal and Rick Steiner. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was kind of cool to be in the ring with a, a Road Warrior and a Steiner. We did have some matches with the Steiners in TNA, which I really, really liked. Um, got, to wrestle, got to wrestle Eaton and Condry one night in Florida, Ooh. but that was a big deal. But um, as far as bucket list things right now, you know, not not really. But there are certain talents out there. I know that, um, especially on the microphone, especially with the stories that can be told, would generate real interest. And there is a major story sitting right in front of everybody right now in the world of wrestling that is just waiting to happen, and it still hasn't happened. And I can't believe certain people don't see it. It's you signing with the WWE and then getting released again. I never got released. See, that's a dick statement. That's why you stood in the corner. That's why you Watch need to this. go back in the fucking Wait a minute, corner. Dennis. That's when my did best I get buddy released there. from the WWE? I didn't mean again, but I just with all the rumors. No, 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 no. When did it happen the first time? It did. You I fucked was, up. It'd be funny. You oh, fucked see, up. You, you like you to throw in up. a little jab like that. That's why you stood in the corner because you're a walking, <laughs> talking douche nozzle. I'll take that. I'm okay oh. with that. Yeah, that's actually that's the nicest thing you said to me, and I'm really happy. <laughs> that, I put that on my grave because, dude, we all love you. So this is awesome. Ah, damn it. Hear that, Lars? Douche you're, a, you're a douche nozzle. It you're, not even, you're not even. You're not even the douche. You're just the nozzle. I know the it, thing. You're the thing that gets squirts the water out. I'm you're the really, applicator of the douche. You're the, you're the applicator. You're not even the douche, bro. Right. And it made my day. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. You know? You got, a, you got another question, Dennis? No. That's the same thing my mom calls me, <laughs> by the way. So that's great. <laughs> no, I'm just going to go back in the corner, guys. <laughs> tell me when you guys are done waxing poetically. But uh, I, I guess I do. And uh, do, do, when did it hit you? your impact on the wrestling business because you know we all grew up and you were one of the big three you know when you think of those tag teams in the 90s and the 2000s the Dudley boys were right there 1a 1b 1c and a lot of times guys like to either be humble or play that they're humble uh, with their impact on the wrestling business you know pd does it a lot and I, lars and i we kind of get on like stop dude you're not just a guy that got lucky with the move as far as you go did, when did it hit you that, holy shit, I changed the business? Well, first of all, humble doesn't sell tickets, uh, especially when the red light is on. So I'm not a big believer in that humble bullshit when the camera is rolling. When the camera's off, it's a completely different story. Um, I don't think it has even hit me that we changed the business or did anything. We just went out there and we did what we did. Me and Devon did not know any other way to do things but to go out there every night as work horses and do our best to steal a show it's great for me to if, if i do an appearance or a show now when 50 and 60 year old men and women are coming to me and introducing their kids to me and they're passing it down to the next generation like hey bubba i saw you at you know uh you know the royal rumble 2000 this is my kid we brought him to see you you know tonight or, or you know something like that that's really cool. All that stuff that comes with the territory is cool. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll see on social media, like an up and coming tag team will hit a 3D. I think that's pretty cool. I don't get mad or anything like that. If somebody's doing our shit, it's like, 
if somebody does a cover of a rancid song, Lars, are you mad? No, no. Oh, no. that's like the biggest compliment that somebody who could write their own song wants to cover one of your songs and pay you for it. Yeah. You know, like that, that that's a compliment to me. So I enjoy all of that stuff. But as far as, you know, hitting me or... Now, don't get don't get me wrong. If we get into a, a an on screen discussion about who's the best, I'll tell you that they are the greatest tag team until the cows come home. And I got the accolades and the gold and the this that and the other thing to prove it. That's why on TV it's like, now nah, all bets are off. Well, you know, it's been a kind of a strange couple of weeks for wrestling. I mean, we had I don't know if you know about this. I'm sure you do, and I wanted to kind of touch on it. You know, we had the wrestler in the ring going after the ref. We had the guy attacking uh, homeboy over there, you know what I mean? And it was all like, and my son actually was the one that explained it to me, you know, what had actually gone down. Um, but like, I mean, do you see this as something that's like, um, you know, it's just because was this happening in the business, you know, that people weren't finding out about where these types of things happening now that we have the internet, it seems like, you know, there's, it's, we're, it's, it's a lot more accessible, but were you ever, you know, in, 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 a, in a building where some, something like this happened besides the New Jack incident? I mean, we, we started riots almost on a nightly basis. I mean, I can't tell you how many times the cops came to an ECW show because what we did, the riot dogs were called in. We would fight entire sections of fans. <laughs> we're not, this is not made up shit. You're friends with Sign Guy, right? Yeah, I know. He'll tell you. He was right there for it. Um, so a lot of a lot of crazy shit went down in ECW, and I don't I don't even really tell the stories anymore because by today's standards, they sound like completely made up stories. Like, no, that never happened. You never jumped over a guardrail and punched a fan in the face and broke his nose. Well, yep, we did. You know, you, you never, you never said this. Yes, we did. You know, you didn't have, you, you didn't have a people jumping out of the balcony of the Elks Lodge trying to, to get to you because you said something about their wife. Yep. That happened. It just doesn't sound, it doesn't sound realistic, but that's what went on. As far as the, 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 the guy who did that thing to the referee, I don't know all the details, but from what I do know, that's horrible. Yeah. Horrible. That's, that's not, what part, what part of sports entertainment is that? It's definitely not pro wrestling. What part of sports entertainment is it? It's not. Yeah, you got your 15, you got your 15 seconds of fame, but it was all bad. Yeah, he's... I mean, that's the, only, that's the only reason why I would think that you would do that. You know what I mean? That, that honestly is to get attention, but or, or otherwise there's something obviously a little off here, like something, there was a disconnect. Or something you know like you, you you mentioned new jack and that that one night the mass <coughs> incident i wasn't there devon was i don't know what was going through jack's mind but as a guy who has been in the ring with new jack probably more than just about anybody else we never had we had zero problems with jack and basically, me and Devon, we were Jack's crash test dummies. Every night, the Dudleys would wind up getting heat on somebody, and New Jack's music would hit. And then he would hit us with anything and everything he could find. Vacuum cleaners, toasters, the kitchen sink, dildos, uh, ten penny nails. I mean, everything. Everything. And it was always great business. Never once did we get into it with Jack. Never once. And Jack made a career out of Barry and me and Devon. A career out of it. And then we saw him one day and he said, oh, come on, guys. You know, I'm just working. We get it. It's all good. You know? Um, never experienced a problem with anybody like that. Um, and I, I think that situation is unfortunate. Hmm. We got time for one more question a piece, and I guess mine is going to kind of go back to the radio show Busted Open, who we're both big fans of Lars and myself. And there's a kind of a you know a a, a coalition here where 
our podcast kind of started with a bunch of famous guys that like to talk about sports and wrestling. And then we narrowed it down to wrestling and busted open, did the same thing. And, and kind of harken back to when did you know, was it, was, you know, getting talked into doing a radio show hard for you because uh, once again, I'm going to go back off of uh, misconceptions about you. Uh, to me, I would think that there would have had to have been a very hard sell job to get you to do a, a wrestling radio show. Nobody asked me to do a wrestling radio show. No, Sirius XM didn't approach me. None of the higher ups came to me. The, what, that, that never happened. Here's how mm. Busted Open happened with LaGreca and Bully Ray. LaGreca sent out a tweet years ago. And he said, in his opinion, Okada and Omega was the greatest match that he'd ever seen. Mm. And I was in my wrestling school. I was at the Team 3D Academy at, the, at our Florida location. And I walked outside and I texted him and I said, you really think this was the greatest wrestling match you've ever seen? And he goes, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And I called him and we started to discuss the merits of his tweet. I told him why I didn't think it was the greatest wrestling match of all time. I gave a couple of examples, uh, you know, and we started to go back and forth. And I said to him, did you ever think about taking Busted Open to the next level? And he goes, what do you mean? I go, think in terms of ESPN, like the Stephen A. Smith and the uh, Skip Bayless, how they used to go back and forth at one another about, you know, whether it was the Cowboys or, you know, whatever things they were talking about in baseball. It was always them, the banter between the two, the arguing between the two. LaGreca and Mortman was great, but you got two fans talking about pro wrestling. I always thought Boston Open could be something different, not necessarily better, but different if you had an actual wrestler. Now you had both perspectives. Now you had the Uber fan and you had the pro and we could bring it all together. And within, I think, 48 hours, Dave had called Marissa, who's the head of the channel, worked out a deal and that was it. And that's how it all happened. It was a discussion around Okada Omega. Wow. And here we are. You know what I mean? And well, I, I, always, turn- I always loved radio. Uh, I had a couple of friends, a uh, good friend of mine, uh, Jason Bailey, Buckethead, who's worked in Orlando. He's worked in Tampa, a lot of big markets. Uh, you know, always loved him on the air, jumped on the air with him whenever I could. I was always interested in radio. Um, and I just, I thought Busted Open could be a, a little bit different. And I always give Dave props and I give Doug props because they, that's their rock and roll band. You know, the Dudleys is my rock and roll band. Busted Open is Dave's rock and roll band and Doug's rock and roll band. And I will always, you know, I always defer to Dave because, hey, you started this. You know, this is yours. I'll, I'll give my opinion, but at the end of the day, this is your gig, man. Well, I want to talk to you about music because, you know, I never would I ever think about hearing Venom pl- being played on a, not only on, a, on, a, on the radio that wasn't like a college radio station, but hearing it on Sirius XM busted open as a, you know, bumper music to get you into the next segment. I mean, that blew my mind. So obviously you're very schooled into the eighties metal. I mean, you like motorhead. I mean, there's obviously that picture of you in a motorhead t-shirt, you know what I mean? You, you I know your love for kiss and I know look Greca's got his top 10 of favorite kiss songs. Does bully Ray have a top 10 kiss song list? No, no, no. I don't have it- favorites. I don't have top tens. I don't do any of that stuff. Like LaGreca makes up lists and he like, he narrows them down and he, he laminates them and he hangs them on the wall. He likes to flip through his lists every day. I don't have any of that. I, kn- I just know what I like when I like it. And that's it. I, I, and I'm, I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a rock and roll Mark. I love, you know, I'm, I'm a, you know, I like punk. I like metal. I like glam. I can listen to Venom and Slayer. I, I, I like it all. Like I could listen to, you know, uh, you know, I can listen to, you know, Welcome to Hell by Venom. And right behind that, you know, look what the cat dragged in by Poison. <laughs> right now you want to tell me to fuck off so bad. No, 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 no. I mean, but to me, to me, it's like, you know, like my kids like different kinds of like rap music and, you know, they're schooling me on a bunch of things. And my mind's always completely open 
you know, for me, it just, if as long as it feels dirty and it's got aggression to it, I'm going to be attracted to it. So whether that comes in soul, you know, r and you know, reggae, punk rock, rock and roll, I'm always going to gravitate to you, uh, to it. Do you, is Kiss your all time favorite band? No. Okay. This is, Kiss is like my, I'm going to have, if I have to put a number on these things, one is Motley, two is ACDC, three is Kiss. Okay. So at least we got your top three. And that's what I had to do because I mean, as I mean, my first my first album though was Kiss Alive too, and much okay. like so many other you know kids my age, when you opened it up, it was a life changing moment. But then my second album, I'm my I'm, you know what my bad. First was Kiss Alive too, then it was Back in Black, and then it was Shout at the Devil. Okay. And Shout at the Devil kind of followed the same you know the same mo as Kiss because it opened up and it was the four of them. And like, I became a Motley Mark overnight. Like I could tell you what time those guys took shits. That's how big <laughs> of, a, of a Mark I was for crew. And the thing about it is, it's a good time. When you went to these shows or where you listened to music, it was always about a good time to me. And, you know, growing up in the 80s with hard rock and metal and and then all of a sudden you get smacked in the face with Smells Like Teen Spirit. It all came to a grinding halt. Not that I don't think it's a great song or some of those songs from the 90s was, but it was very different for me. A lot to get used to. Well, I mean, it's funny that you mentioned those three bands because I kind of feel like that's you as a pro wrestler. And because and like ACDC is that brick and mortar, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Uh, the Motley Crue is the, is the theatrics and, and Kiss is also the theatrics. And I think that anybody who loves Kiss loves pro wrestling. It's, it seems like anybody that I know that likes pro wrestling loves Kiss. And it's probably because of the kabuki makeup. And they look like fucking wrestlers. I mean, let's just be honest. Yeah. But uh, it kind of makes the whole sense, you know, going through tables, you know, the whole thing, the smash and the explosions. Spectacle. So Spectacle. I, I guess, yes, your top three is, is, is you as a professional wrestler. How does that make you feel? I feel wonderful inside. I'll, t- I'll tell you, I'll tell you one quick story. Um, okay. I'll, I'll leave you with this because this was a cool moment for me as a pro wrestler and a fan of rock and roll, more specifically kiss. Um, when we were before COVID, when we were in the studio in New York city, uh, Gene Simmons came in live in studio with us because he was pushing something called the vault. He had the Gene right. Simmons vault. This is probably like four or five years ago. And we had him in. And, you know, Gene, he, he's doing a million interviews and everything. And you got you to gotta do and say something to, you know, to really get him interested. And we were able to get him interested in the conversation. And then afterwards, once he was done, he spent about 15 minutes with us. I said, listen, I know you've heard it all, but I'm going to tell you my story real, real quick. I said, you're not the only one to perform in, in front of 100,000 people in this room. So... You know, I I get it. I said, but the way I've patterned my tag team, the way I pattern my act, the way I go out there and try to entertain is all based off a kiss show, like studying a kiss show and seeing the roller coaster ride you give me. And I gave him the whole how we love to start off with Detroit Rock City and then shout it out loud and rock and roll all night. And I and I basically explained to Gene that my success as a pro wrestler and what I do out there on my stage, which is a ring is doing exactly what they did on a stage. And Lars, when I was done telling him the story, this smile came over his face and I knew he had never heard anything like this before. Right. So thank you very much. You know, very nice. And then I had a kiss box set. I have it here somewhere. And I wanted to get it signed for my nephew. And I would normally never ask for the autograph. But I told him it was for my nephew, Ricky. And when my nephew gets old enough, I want to give him this box set so he can, you know, get on his path to rock and roll with Kiss. And Gene takes a $10 bill out of his pocket and he signs it for me. And he goes, now when your nephew buys his first CD or his first album or downloads his first song, I bought it for him. Wow. That's a pretty cool freaking story. Yeah, that is a cool story. So I took the $10 bill signed by Gene Simmons and it's in the, the kiss box set that I'll give to my nephew eventually cool. when he can start appreciating it. Wow. That's very cool. 
That's yeah. very cool. Busted open, got XM, Fight Nation. Uh, that's one of the only reasons why I have XM right now. Thank you, A, so much for doing the radio show all the time and keeping me entertained on my drive home, Lars, too. Uh, where can people find you? Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there, there you have it. Listen. He's at the big and tall, at the big and tall area. Yeah, at the big and tall uh, in the husky <laughs> section. I don't Lord. plug. I don't have anything to plug. You got a fucking. You got an Instagram. You got a Twitter. You got a radio show. Come on, bully. Do you need a manager or what? I, I have to look. I don't even know my Twitter handle. I really don't. Hold on. Why don't? Okay. Oh, it's Bully Ray fifty one fifty. Yeah, follow him. Wait, well, listen. I, one last question though. Why don't you write a book? Um, one day I will, or we will, me and Devon already got offered an opportunity to write a book. They wanted too much dirt ah. that didn't involve us. Right, right, right. And I mean, if, when you're brought up the right way in the wrestling business, Mm. No, I get it. I get it. I, I, yeah, I totally get it. But I mean, that's one book that I would buy. It's, it's, it would be a pretty good. So we, we do have good, you know, good stories. It's, it's been a hell of a ride. It, it, it really has. It's been a fun ride. I'm very, very blessed. I, listen, me and Devon, for years, I mean, 20 years, we never fought. Never fought. No arguing. No, we got into one fight. The fight lasted three minutes. In Ottawa, Canada. Mm. One disagreement. Can you tell us what that was about? Sorry. Um, I, I think that was one of those nights where uh, I was off or he was off. And I said, come on, man, you got to up your game. And he's like, fuck you, you got to up your game. And scuffle, broken up, yeah. all over with. I mean, that's it. We never, we, we always saw, I know, we were really, really on the same page. We're well-oiled machine for a long, long time. Well, listen, he's Lars Fredrickson. He's Bully Ray. I'm Douche Nozzle. Thank you so much for listening to the Wrestling Perspective this week. Yeah, get in your fucking corner. Have a good night, everybody.